what happened when, what is time. A really, a really great book to read in 2020 when that also happened. Oh hi, welcome back to part two of the video. Let's pick up where we left off. Marcus Heights the Dwarves. Ooh, this was, this was a good one. I really enjoyed reading this. I really enjoyed reading a story that was dwarf-centric. There was a quote from Marcus Heights in this book, in like one of the, about the author sections, where it was like, often dwarves are just supplementary to elves and men and other, other fantasy staples. They're always side characters or comic relief or something. And he wanted to write a story that was purely driven by the dwarves in the world. They're the heroes, they're on the adventure, they are the reason for reading. That definitely came across in this book. Really enjoyed reading it. This is definitely in the higher echelons of the tier list. This book sort of took place in two parts. One, we're sort of following Tung Dil on his own, and he's got his own sort of mission that he's on. Then later on he meets some other dwarves and gets introduced to dwarven society. Uh, because he was because he was an outcast from dwarven society, He, despite being a dwarf, he'd never actually met another dwarf. He was raised by humans which was a really interesting detail, but then he meets the other dwarves, we get a little crew together and then they have their own other mission that they've got to go and go on. Really, really enjoyed it. Really good fantasy storyline. There was a quest, we got a crew going on to do a quest, loved it, and they're all dwarves. Dwarves are definitely still an underrated fantasy race, so it's great to have a book devoted to them, and I'm definitely going to probably continue this series at some point, because I know there are more books that continue. Something I really did like about this book is it works as a standalone. I know there are other books in the series that, that follow on, but there is an issue and it is resolved within the first book. You can read it as just a singular quest. There is a character in this book called Nudin the Knowledge Lusty, and I don't particularly have anything to say <laughs> about him other than what a name. Nudin the Knowledge Lusty. Nudin the Knowledge Lusty. What a name. Something else that really stood out to me about this book was there's sort of a race of Dark Elves that are in this book and they're called the Alpha. They have a really cool physical description. Pale with like white white hair and they've got eyes that are completely glossed over black. Completely black eyes. And here's a little fact about me. I'm a sucker for <laughs> characters that have the completely glossed over black eye look. That is very appealing to me. Just something about it is like, oh, I love this. Very cool villain, not only appearance, but a uh, threat as well. They are a prominent threat in the book. Anytime you're like, oh, maybe there are some alpha here, it's like, oh shit, are all of our characters gonna make it out okay? It was also a, su a surprisingly dark book at, at places. Like, the first few chapters have a bit of a whimsical feel to them, but then, like, dark, really dark stuff starts happening, especially with some of the things that the Alpha are doing. Went some darker places than I was expecting. Nonetheless, really, really enjoyable. That's going in A tier. Psychology of Time Travel by Kate Mascarenas. One of many names that I'm sure I'm butchering during this video. This takes a look at what if time travel was actually invented and it's become a staple of the universe. It was a very short book and it's a, a crime thriller that uses time travel as a plot device, which is really, really cool. Really cool world building as well. In the modern day, there's like a hub for time travel and it's got different rules. It's almost like the, the time travel center is its own country because time operates on a different set of rules to place. And I really enjoyed this. Very fast paced, very cool, lots of like figuring out, oh, what's going on? When's the, all this happening? The characters in it, really, really strong. It all comes together at the end in a very satisfying way. I think I am also going to put this in A tier. I really enjoyed this and like I'm, I'm thinking back to it now and especially the way that time travel got built into the world. It was a really cool take on time travel that I don't really think that I've seen in other time travel stories. So this is going up here. I think this is going... It's going either side of the dwarves. I think I'm actually going to put it above the dwarves. Really cool book, definitely recommend it. So, oh, that was another thing. Another flaw of the dwarves was it did have somewhat of a lack of female characters compared to the male characters in the story. Psychology of Time Travel, most of the characters were female, which was which was quite refreshing because I read Psychology of Time Travel right after the dwarves. Another thing that this book did really well was explore what the ability to time travel would actually do to someone's psyche. How it could drive you paranoid or insane. With of like what happened when, what is time. A really, a really great book to read in 2020 when that also happened. All right, A Gathering of Shadows. This is one of several stories I consumed that, that deals with alternate Londons. <laughs> On this list, I've got A Gathering of Shadows, Rivers of London, and Neverwhere. All alternate London stories. Why has that become a weird sub subgenre? I don't know. Also, I was watching His Dark Materials, which has two different Londons as well. That's not on this list because it's a TV show, not a book. 
Well, it, it is a book, but I didn't read it yet. Gathering of Shadows. So this is the second book in the Shades of Magic series. I think this is a pretty strong contender for B tier. The title promises a different kind of story than we get. Uh, and I know judging a book on its title is, is not necessarily how you're supposed to judge a book, but A Gathering of Shadows does promise a bit of a darker story to, to what came before, or at least I, I felt it did. However, the story we actually get in this book is much lighter than the first installment in the series. It's a much lower stakes story. It's basically a tournament arc, but it was really enjoyable to read. A lot of the complaints that I've seen people make about this series is we get introduced to these four different worlds, but there's not that much exploration of the worlds themselves, especially the alternate ones, especially in the first book. It's basically, oh, here's a world, anyway, on with the plot. But in A Gathering of Shadows, we do get to see a little bit more of the world of Red London, where most of the story takes place. We get introduced to different nations, and they've got their own cultures going on, and we have the tournament, the Essen Tash, the Element Games. It's people having magical fights, and it's a fun time. Well, not necessarily the most plot-driven book, I definitely did enjoy reading it. There is a subplot with a character from the first book who I will not name because it's kind of a spoiler. And that's sort of where most of the plot is, and that is the where the title The Gathering of Shadows makes the most sense. But it's mainly just set up for the next book, and like, it's very light on overall plot until the very end few chapters. Nonetheless, it's still a very enjoyable time, and something I, that I especially liked about this book is that Prince Rai got his own POV chapters. From memory, I don't think he had any in A Darker Shade of Magic, the first book, and I think that was a missed opportunity. It would have been great to have his perspective on things, because he is a great character, probably my favourite from the series. And in the first book, we get to know how Kel feels about Rai, and how Kel perceives Rai feeling about him. Would have been great to have from the get-go, also, this is how Rai perceives Kel. Because, you know, they're brothers, and then Kel, Rai, and Lila are like the core trio of characters for this series, but we only have really Lila and Kel's perspective in the first book. We don't get Rise until this book. We also get the introduction of Alucard in this book, who is a great character. He definitely does add to the series, I really liked his character. Uh, and it was great to see how those four then sort of interacted with each other based on the different relationships that they all have. So, uh, an enjoyable read, but very, uh, very light on actual plot, and it definitely very much felt like a middle book. I am going to put it above Armageddon Rack, though. I think I probably enjoyed it a little bit more, because I was already invested in the series and the characters, uh, and it's a very cool world. I very much enjoyed it. Vasht is next. Let's continue on our alternate London trend. Uh, Rivers of. This one is either B or C. It's either low B or, or high C. Uh, high C's. It was an enjoyable enough read. I liked the main two characters in it. It did make me think pretty much constantly as I was reading it of the scene from a very Potter senior year where the auras just burst in and like, hey motherfuckers, we're the wizard cops. That's basically what this book is. It had a mystery, it had characters I enjoyed, it had an interesting sort of hidden magic in the city which was cool to get into, but uh, when I'm thinking back on it now, I can't think of any like really fond moments from it or any moments that stood out to me that much. And I don't know if I am really that invested in continuing the series or just saying I read the first one and it was alright. And I'm thinking this is probably landing it a high C place. I can't really think of any specific things that I found lacking in Rivers of London, but there also weren't any specific things that I found that were particularly grabbing, uh, so that's why it's going C and not B. And our other alternate London story, Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. This was a really cool book. I hadn't actually read any Neil Gaiman books other than Norse mythology, but I have seen a bit of American Gods and I've seen all of Good Omens and I really enjoyed especially Good Omens. So I was definitely interested to get into more of Neil Gaiman's novel writing works. I enjoyed Neverwhere quite a bit. I enjoyed getting to explore this weird fantastical world. I enjoyed how all of the things in London became literal, like Angel Islington was an actual angel. Very whimsical. Really enjoyed the whole aspect of it. The world building was excellent. Characters were very much enjoyable and engaging and I really liked just following them and seeing their story. This is very strongly speaking to me as a B tier book. It's not quite A tier. I didn't quite love it as much as some of these that are already in A tier. Definitely not gonna be lower than B. I'm just trying to think where among these that I've already got in B is it going? Okay, I think I'm gonna have that for B tier. This is what B tier, B tier is looking like for now. That's the alternate London stories. Here's one that's something of an outlier. This is the only classic fiction that I have 
on my list, and it is Bram Stoker's Dracula. I was not expecting to like this as much as I did. I was expecting it to be quite a dry story, because it was written a while ago, and that tended to be how stories back then were written. And it, and it still was somewhat dry, but uh, it really did surprise me with, with how much I enjoyed reading it. Something that I especially caught me off guard is, nowadays, in the real world, you hear Dracula and you think, oh yeah, vampires, evil vampires, that sort of thing. Whereas, at the start of this novel, the main character, uh, Jonathan Harker, is going to deal with this guy, and I was expecting Dracula to be going under a, a pseudonym of some kind, but no, he's just Count Dracula out in the open because no one knows the connotations of Dracula <laughs> yet at the time this is being written. That threw me. Dracula, I think it's probably B. There were new characters that I didn't know that were associated with the lore of Dracula that were really fun to sort of read about. Interesting to note that Van Helsing in this book is nothing like the sort of Van Helsing that we think of today, like the Hugh Jackman Van Helsing, for example, who is this badass vampire hunter. In, in the book, Van Helsing is just kind of a nerdy doctor who happens to know a fair bit about vampires. I'm gonna put this low B. Low B tier for Dracula. B for Bram. From werewolves to vampires. No, other way around. Vampires to werewolves. We've got The Last Werewolf here by Glenn Duncan. I look like a werewolf these days, with especially with with all this going on. This book for me was a swing and a miss, and I know I'm gonna be putting that in detail, I'm not even gonna hover it around. I did not enjoy The Last Werewolf. The basic premise here is, there's this organization that are going around and hunting supernatural creatures like werewolves, vampires, and the like, and there is only one werewolf left in the world, and that is the main character that we're following. He knows that he's the last one, and he knows they're coming for him, and it's another case of, as similar to Children of Time, a character is being presented with a lot of opportunities to, to, to follow a plot and just not taking them. <laughs> but there were some interesting world building choices, especially with that organization. There were some decent enough action scenes, but all in all, this book failed to grab me particularly. And I was, I was excited to read this book. I love werewolves as like a, a fantasy monster or a horror monster. So I thought I would enjoy it, but I ended up feeling not that much attachment to the main character, not that much attachment to w where the story was going. But I didn't dislike like this book as much as I disliked this book, Assassins of Athens. Now I will say up front, great title. I just love saying that Assassins of Athens, oh, that is the reason I bought the book. I'd be lying if I said otherwise. Unfortunately, that's where my praise for the book ends. You're probably aware there's certain cliches about male authors, especially when male authors write female characters, and this book is littered with them. I found the main character to be insufferably arrogant. There were certain things in the book that sort of kept me hooked just enough that I got to finish it. Like, I kept waiting for assassins to show up, for example, but we never really got that deep into the assassin culture. Didn't like the characters, didn't like the writing style, didn't like the book. Apologies to Jeffrey Seiger, but I did not enjoy Assassins of Athens. A apart from the title, that's still a very fun title to say, to be honest. Assassins of Athens. Ooh. This video is definitely going to be split up into several parts.